Um, different sources, obviously, for Christian. So I said got relatively important strontium, especially over the longer term. But you've got zirconium and cerium particularly high, which is because it was, as I said, a, a, a waste silo, radioactive waste silo. Um, for wind scale, this went up the chimney, um, but you've got this polonium-210, uh, which at the time was not really uh, well known. It wasn't measured initially at all. The focus was on the iodine, not the polonium. For Chernobyl, we have iodine, large amount of iodine, cesium, one po about 1.6 to 1, strontium, plutonium, zirconium, cerium, ruthenium. Uh, and for Fukushima, again we have iodine 131, but we have the cesium 137 and 134 at a ratio of about 1 to 1. So in comparative terms, the reduction in radio cesium after Fukushima Daiichi accident occurs faster than that from Chernobyl because there's relatively more 134 than, the, the, than there was in the Chernobyl accident. Uh, then strontium, plutonium, zirconium, yeah, so very little of these. Much of these isotopes around the Chernobyl site, um, most many of them are close to the zone, so they're the only exclusion zone. I mean, there are some outside the exclusion zone, but, but the highest concentrations are in the exclusion zone. So the Christian accident was 29th of September, 1957, as I said, producing weapons-grade plutonium at Chelyabinsk-40 in the Urals in USSR. Um, there was a failure of the cooling system for the storage tank, so there was a, a non-nuclear thermal explosion. Um, and we had a contaminated plume called the East Urals Trace, which went up from the plant in that direction. And this is in the, the Urals in Russia, Russian Federation. In the emergency phase, the, the area to be considered was defined by the strontium deposition density because strontium was considered to be the key radionuclide for this accident. Um, and that was set at 3.7 kilobecquerels per meter square. So the USSR at the time uh, looked at the contamination within that boundary once it had been measured. Um, the major initial contributor dose was external gamma radiation because of the range of radionuclides that were there. And the highest radionuclear content in most food products in the early stages were from cerium-144 and zirconium-95. Um, and the contamination levels of those things was between this range in the very early stages. So again, everybody thinks of a nuclear accident as being you know, problems with iodine and cesium, but uh, this in, in this particular case it was totally different. Um, and in the longer term, the, well, the milk was about 70% of the red content of milk. That what I mean is 70% of the milk uh, had a, was produced in areas which were within that boundary, uh, which was over the limits. And the, so the food intervention limits were, were imposed by the Soviet authorities. And there was a long-term intensive remediation from the spring of 1958. Um, um, a very great effort in remediation in the area which focused on not only the deposition density but on, also on the soil type because the soil type greatly affected the amount of strontium that was taken up from the soil into the, the grass and the fodder that was eaten by the cows but also strontium uptake into uh, crops was important. So it wasn't just the milk, it was also the crops. 
Um, and there were certain soils that where there was a high strontium uptake where they had a low exchangeable calcium because you know, strontium and calcium behave very similarly. So, the, so in effect, the strontium-90 behavior was dominated by the calcium, the exchangeable calcium. Um, and so you can't, you can't, when you're trying to quantify strontium transfer, you cannot do it without considering the calcium. You have to look at the calcium status of everything uh, that you're looking at, the, all the pathways. If you just measure strontium, it's useless because it is very dependent on calcium status. So the remediation strategy focused on agriculture, fisheries, there are a lot of lakes in this area. When you go around, there are lakes everywhere. Um, and a lot of forest as well. But the remediation reference level after the emergency phase was set at 74 kilobecquerels per meter square of strontium. And that, that actually was about 1,000 kilometers squared. Um, and 55% of that was agricultural land. So there was, uh, well, yeah, 55, 5, 5, no, 550 kilometer squares of agricultural land to remediate. As I mentioned before, strontium was mainly deposited in the animal bones. But I saw there was this long biological half-life of strontium which sustained the secretion of strontium into milk. Uh, enhanced contamination if there was chronic strontium intake by dairy animals. So if they were chronically contaminated at the start, that had a long-term effect on the levels in the milk. Um, if, if they were, you know, alive when the actual deposition happened and they were grazing on pasture. And the ingestion of contaminated food was the key long-term exposure pathway, not external exposure. It, it was the, the milk right up in, until... Uh, and, but after you know, only milk after five to eight years. So after that time period, it, the crops were not a problem anymore. It was just the milk that was a problem in terms of remediation. The remediation options used, um, topsoil was removed in this accident from some areas, not all. There was deep ploughing and shallow ploughing, turnover ploughing where you put the contaminated soil underneath, liming and extra mineral fertilisers, selecting varieties of crop which had a lower uptake of strontium, and moving from milk production to pig and poultry production because strontium levels in meat are very low. So there was a shift in the agricultural production type. These procedures were relatively effective in Kushtib and one of the reasons was because the agricultural status and the level of fertilizers used was quite low in these areas. So increasing and improving the fertilizer status of the soils was very effective in reducing the strontium uptake. Um, and these are the maximum deposition densities of strontium for different animal products because they vary depending on the transfer. So with, and they had them for without remediation and with remediation. So for pork, for instance, where this was the intervention value, the deposition that was, that was allowed when you hadn't remediated was lower than when you had remediated. So for, this is beef, the blue, and this is milk. Whereas pork was higher. The pork value was higher because the transfer to the pork was much lower. Are you with me? One more time. <laughs> this is without remediation. So if there was nothing done, you could put your cows onto the pasture if this was the contamination level. So you could put your cows on pasture with a higher contamination level than if they were producing milk. If they were producing milk, the contamination of the pasture had to be lower because the transfer to milk is higher. But for pork, you could put them on much more contaminated land because the transfer to pork milk was that much lower. So this is using knowledge of transfer to set different limits for different types of animals on pasture. <laughs> 
or on feed. So it was quite a sophisticated system that relied on good local knowledge and quantification of the transfer rates to different types of food in the area. And one other thing I said about calcium being important for strontium, um, there was found to be a relationship between the transfer to milk and the calcium intake of the, of the cows. So you had a high transfer when the cows had a low calcium intake. But if you gave the cows more calcium, you got a much lower value. So it's up 0.006 here, down to 0.001 there, if you increase the calcium content of the milk. So this was one of the measures that was used in the former Soviet Union in USSR in 1957. Okay, so, would this work if such a situation were to arise in Japan? Should you do this? Is it a good idea in Japan? Hands up for yes. Three. Hands up for no. Three, four. The fours have it. The answer is no. Why? Because most animals in Western Europe have a calcium intake around here already. Because we have a much more intensive agricultural system than the USSR in the late 1950s and 60s. Because they had very poor uh, fertilizer, they had poor land with poor nutrient status. So if they gave more calcium, the animals actually needed that calcium and were much better animals. But normally they didn't get that calcium, they were calcium deficient, they were down here. So by giving them calcium, it reduced the strontium level. But the calcium intake of cows in, in Japan, in Western Europe, in the USA, they're here already. So giving more calcium wouldn't work. So it's another example of looking carefully at the data that you're using and thinking about whether that particular system, an agricultural production system, is relevant to your country and your agricultural system. No. And taking data from a poor uh, soils with a subsistence economy more than 50 years ago is probably not a good idea. Yeah. And we've shown this. We've also shown that you know, if, you, if you gave more calcium here, you would actually put the cows into, um, in, into a poor physiological status because they'd have too much calcium. So it would be a negative impact rather than a positive impact on the health of the cows. Okay, totally different accident. We, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yep. Um. Oh. That's going the wrong way. Sorry. No. Nope. Yeah, but it, it, it's higher, but it's about, it's about 0.2. But uh, I, I would find that uh, the cut in big of storage of calcium has uh, not so much time, right? But, so I, I understand that both the uptake of both here and the senior. Yeah. But now we find the negative here. Yeah, but it doesn't, 
it's not just it's not just the gut transfer that impacts it. It, it also impacts it from how, how much goes from the plasma to the different parts of the animal. So it's not just a single relationship. There's other things going on in the cow, like the uh, you have a an active transport from the plasma to the milk, for instance, and that can be impacted by the calcium for the, for the amount of strontium. So so the calcium competes with the strontium. So so it's not it's not just a linear thing. So there is a, a competition between calcium and strontium between yeah. between gut and milk. Yeah, and but, uh, between in the gut, this competition, and between the plasma and the milk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one scale accident. Um, it's again associated with uh, atomic bombs, this plant. Um, and the plant was supplying plutonium for the British Atomic Bomb Project, um, but also generated other, other um, nuclei through neutron irradiation. Um, and I can't go into the physics, partly because I don't understand it, um, but there was stored Wigner energy which led to a fire in one of the units which burned for three days. Uh, it was the level of five accident uh, and I've told, showed you before, the key releases were iodine, cesium, and polonium. Um, this area is very rural. The, the population density is quite low. Uh, there are mountains just behind the plants. Um, but there is cow milk in the coastal areas. Uh, there are sheep in the upland areas. Um, Okay. In addition to um, the release, part of the release had quite a lot of particulates in it. So there was a quite a complex release with particulates as well as aerosol material uh, in the release itself. Um, iodine, from the monitoring that was done, the, the, it was immediately realised that iodine 131 was the major hazard at the time. But there was hardly any guidance on how to set an intervention level, how to calculate one even. There were, no, there were none of these reference uh, safety levels or transfer ratios available. So, the, the, so the, the, the scientists in the UK had to derive something themselves on what level they thought was a safe level in, uh, to constrain the doses for the thyroid. And therefore, you know, what was, what was okay for milk and what was okay as a deposition value. All this the scientists had to work out within a day uh, when the accident actually happened. Um, and they actually sent a, they literally did almost a back of an envelope calculation. They just sat around a table with a piece of paper and they worked out what they thought would be an acceptable value. Um, and the West Coast strip, which had the cows grazing, uh, was remediated, well, countermeasures were applied running from 10 kilometres north to 20 kilometres south of Windscale. Um, cow milk was collected from all those farms and it was diluted and it was dumped into the Irish Sea. So they used channels of milk, normal disposal channels for sewage, etc., were then used to dispose of all the milk out into the Irish Sea. Um, so iodine was by far, you know, important in the early phase, but there was also information released into the, into the public area rather later, 1962, by Booker initially, in 1962, and these are measurements of cesium. The top value there is, that's 28,000 there, that goes up to 10,000, about 5,000. Uh, so there were measurements at the time for cesium, but relatively few. Um, some, some analysis was done of measures which extended over a wide area later in 1991 using information on the releases and the prevailing weather patterns. Um, and in the 19, late 1980s, 
we could produce a map for wind scale on the basis of some of that data. Um, if you look at the contamination level in this county of Cumbria, there were two sources other than Chernobyl. So when we were looking at Chernobyl, we thought, we, well, what is the contribution of the two other sources? And we knew there was wind scale from those maps you've just seen. But we also had in this area global fallout from the nuclear weapons testing era. And if you don't know, um, the, the intensity of nuclear weapon fallout is highly correlated with the precipitation. So the more it rains, the more nuclear weapons fallout you have. And it rains a lot in this county. I have to use an umbrella very often. Um, so it means that the deposition of nuclear weapons fallout in Cumbria was relatively high. In fact, the highest for the UK. Um, so, so we have, for instance, we have used the models that we developed after the Chernobyl accident for sheep in the county. We applied those to estimated deposition from both wind scale and global fallout. So this is both global fallout and wind scale. The global fallout we could do because we'd already developed a model uh, under the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program where we could predict time and space contamination level right from the 1950s to the present day for any, any area where we have precipitation data at the spatial resolution of the precipitation data. So we have, and we have good spatial deposition data for um, Cumbria. So if we do that, you can see the range of contamination level in the kilometer squares. This is the maximum. So this is for the most contaminated square in Cumbria, the whole of Cumbria. And this is for the least and, and the mean. So the, the, the models that we had developed allowed us to do this for every single kilometer square. In, in Cumbria. And then we could use our models to say if we look at the global fallout and the wind scale contamination and not the Chernobyl but just global fallout and wind scale, would we have had restrictions on sheep in the UK after those accidents? Now this is applying the standards which we use today so which would not have been relevant then. So this is just your hypothetical. Would we have had restrictions after nuclear weapon fallout and after the accident? And the answer is yes, we would have. And the con these are the expected contamination levels in sheep from the global fallout and how they changed with time. So just from nuclear weapon fallout and then from the accident, we would have expected sheep in the upland areas which receive most rain and this is the Pennines which is a, a level of mountains that go down the middle of the country and they would also have had a lot of um, rain so relatively more nuclear weapons fallout so by using the information that we got and the models we produced after the Chernobyl accident we were able to go back and show that the contamination levels just before the just before Chernobyl, we would still have had sheep which would have been restricted due to the other sources. But we weren't aware of it. But if we take away the nuclear weapons fallout and we just look at wind scale as a source, we only have a tiny amount near the plant. So this high concentration in sheep is not due to the wind scale accident particularly, it's due to the nuclear weapons fallout. So the temporal variation in land was very high, you know, the, 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 most of the nuclear bombs were released in this period, going into the stratosphere and then go gradually down with time with a physical half-life. But this is for wind scale 
Oh, really? And this is the probability of the sheep being restricted. So we can do all these sorts of calculations going backwards on sources that we never thought were a problem at the time. So if we had used the current intervention limits, we would have had restrictions needed due to the global fallout and wind scale, due to global fallout on its own, and due to wind scale on its own. And the main contributor is global fallout both in terms of the level and the spatial extent. So, so one of the things from this is to realize that if, you, if animal production is important, and if you live in an area with a very high rainfall, you might have contributors to the contamination which are nothing to do with the accident. Okay, Chernobyl accident. 26th of April 1986, 10 day release. We've talked about the nuclides there already. It was not just the East European countries, which were by far more heavily contaminated, but Western Europe was also affected um, due to where the cloud went and the 10 day release. You know, it was a quite long time for the weather systems to vary. Um, one of the most important things was this high radioiodine level in cow milk, for reasons I've already explained, uh, and high radiocesium in milk and meat. And not just in agricultural animals, but also in semi-natural animals, so animals in the forest, and in Western Europe, in animals that were grazing upland areas, where the soil did not retain the cesium. So the emergency phase countermeasures so are iodine isotopes were intercepted by the plants, eaten by the animals, and in Chernobyl at the time, the animals were outside. They were grazing outside. Um, the response focused on banning milk from collective farms. Um, <laughs> probably most of you weren't born at the time, but um, the... The USSR had a, a production system which was based on collective farms that were state-owned and state-run. Uh, so there was a, because of this state uh, involvement, it was relatively um, efficient for the government and for the responding agencies to immediately get the messages out to the collective farms to stop distributing the milk. So that system was actually very effective uh, because it was a state-run system, you know, not private uh, fibre system. But, there's the big but, is that almost everybody that worked on a collective farm was also a subsistence farmer. So they have their own plots of land. They grow vegetables, they have their own chicken, they have their own cow, they get milk from that cow. They have their own... because they. They know they're just not enough to live on, on from their wages. So everybody produces their own food. And the problem was that while the collective farm system was stopped very quickly, it wasn't stopped efficiently in these private households. So people, the rural people uh, working in the, in the collective farms, etc., continued to drink milk from their own cows. And that milk became highly contaminated. And the consumption milk of milk from those private cows was one of the main causes of thyroid cancers in young children after the Chernobyl accident. It was the failure to stop the consumption of private milk by some of the fam families uh, around the plant in, in Belarus, Russia and Ukraine. So in the existing situation, so the iodine is gone, um, the focus is on cesium. And you have relatively high radio cesium uptake for certain soils in these three countries. Um, and you have, therefore, you have a long-term sustained transfer of radio cesium to animals via the forage crops and the fodder and the pasture. And you have some areas which have sensitive soils. So these soils, what we call radiologically sensitive soils, are those that allow relatively high uptake, much higher than here. 
Um, in Western, Western European areas, the sensitive areas were farms in uplands or animals in forests where there was a low fertilizer status and a high organic matter content of the soil. And by high, we, we have some areas with peats where 90 to 95% of the soil is organic matter. You could literally jump up and down then and it moves up and down. Um, and game and semi-domesticated animals, it was realized, I would say, two to three to four years after the accident, that the contamination levels in hunted animals and semi-domesticated animals like you know, goats that are left to rummage around in, in, in uh, subsistence farms, etc., had relatively high contamination levels uh, because they were, they were not on collective farms where there was some fertilizer usage. You know, they, were, they were sometimes in grazing areas, in forests and things like that, which were relatively poor fertilizer usage, if any, none usually. Um, and the contamination levels in game was found, uh, particularly in Western Europe as well as in Eastern Europe, to be in the thousands of becquerels per kilogram in wild boar, in deer, in, in many different animals in, in forest systems. So we have transferred to these semi-natural products and one of the important ones in Western Europe was, was reindeer in the Scandinavian, fellow Scandian countries where the reindeer, and this also happened after nuclear weapons fallout, so it was a known pathway that the animals eat lichen, which intercepts the cesium when it's deposited, and the animals eat the lichen, and then they become highly contaminated. Um, uh, grouse, I mentioned grouse when I was talking about heather. Uh, roe deer, moose, and, and these you know, sheep and uh, some cows, but also um, goats on these upland areas. And, and this happened throughout Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. You've got high radio season transfer, seasonal trends. So in the autumn, the contamination levels went right up in roe deer. And the reason was they were eating mushrooms. And then it went down again. So you have different characteristics of contamination depending on the time of year. And long effective half lives. So the rate at which the cesium is going down in these systems is very long, and much longer than in agricultural systems. So what do we do about it? Um, well, one of the important thing is to reduce the contamination in the, in the fodder that's produced. Um, uh, but not only do we remediate the, the fields, we clean fed. And in Chernobyl, one of the most important options that was used, because animal production is very important around the Chernobyl area, is to clean feed animals and to use live monitoring. So in these circumstances, you can, when you, a cow is going to be slaughtered in, say, two months' time, you can monitor that animal, decontaminate it, so give it clean feed, but monitor it and make sure you don't kill it until it is below an intervention limit. And this was a system that was used very successfully in the former Soviet Union, so that most the cattle, after the initial period, could continue to be fed on contaminated material and then move to uncontaminated material before slaughter. Um, we also developed a range of materials which absorbed the cesium in the gut and stopped it going through to the, to the plasma. So that instead of this 80 to 100% absorption, it came right down to about 20 to 30% or less using hexacyanoferric molecules. Um, and also changing the feeding strategy and changing you know, what animals were fed and when. So all these systems were very successful in allowing animal production to continue on these highly contaminated areas. Um, the radical improvement, the, the, the focus uh, of um, reducing transfer from the soil was on a wide range of different procedures which were used to improve the quality and the fertilizer status of the soil. Um, and it was very effective. It reduced the, the it increased the productivity to start with. So the farmers were very happy. They were getting about three to five fold greater production than before. 
Um, and it grew, decreased the chance of cesium between, uh, far above by anything from two to tenfold. Tenfold when it was in these uh, soils which had a high uptake. Um, and the farmers loved it. You know, they, get their, they had a total revamp of the production system with you know, lots of fertilizer put on, more things produced. So the farmers were relatively happy. And this decontamination for the young animals when they were going before slaughter, you know, they, had the, they fed contaminated fodder here, they fed uncontaminated fodder here, they had a, a exponential decline which they monitored to be sure that it was below the limits and then the animals could be slaughtered. And this shows that the contamination levels vary for different types of ruminants. So you've got bulls, heifers, cows, pigs and geese here so that the, this is the geese so the smaller the animal the faster it loses the cesium and these were the clay mineral clay minerals were used to stop the cesium going through in the gut but as I said the hexacyan ferrets were actually more useful and most people ended up using hexacyan ferrets rather than clay minerals and these were the hexacyanoferrates, so this is the effect in a goat of, if, if you didn't feed the hexacyanoferrate, you could list contamination levels, wherever you fed the hexacyanoferrate, you kept the levels relatively low. One problem with the hexacyanoferrate was it was blue, bright blue, and some farmers didn't like that. So, you know, it was a case of convincing the farmers by showing that it didn't affect the meat uh, and it kept the cesium levels down. So there was a, a job to be done with the farmers to get them to agree to feed blue stuff to their animals. Uh, quite effective reduction. Um, and the extent to which it was used in the three countries um, Change with time. So initially it went up um, and was particularly used in Belarus, uh, used to a different extent from different countries, uh, much more in Belarus than elsewhere over this period. But then it went down. And the reason was economics. That the, 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 the countries were no longer prepared to continue funding this. So it was left to the individual uh, regional areas to decide whether to continue funding the application of this method. Um, the economic situation when the USSR changed to, to the independent countries and then the different applications in different countries, different policies. Um, but literally it was a, mostly a question of cash, of money to fund these procedures. Okay, um, there was a huge cooperation between um, scientists in the European countries and scientists in former Soviet Union countries, which started in about 1991-92, lasted for about a, a decade or more, where we together looked at the effects of the, of the contamination, the, of the accident, and tried to develop better policy and approaches for coping with accidents. So we looked like things like disposal. You know, what, what was the best disposal method? What would be most accepted by the public? Um, so, so we looked at different disposal routes. We, we uh, looked at how different countries would respond to different disposal routes. And we found that countries had different preferences. So what was OK in? France was different to what was okay in the UK, for instance, just because of the different sensitivities and the different approach of different countries. So it was very clear that one policy, one remediation strategy is not right for the next country, even if it's just within Western Europe. So it was clear that you have to give everybody the information and they decide which strategies, which options are best for them. You can't define that as this is what you should do, you should this by followed by this followed by this, it doesn't work. Countries have their own preferences. 
Uh, we also have set permissible levels, and these are what I said, these are the uh, permissible levels for animal feed from the European Union. And these were the numbers where I couldn't get at how they would arrive. But I don't think they're stupid. I think they're reasonably good numbers. Um, and we also critically became, real, we realised the importance of taking into account what the farmers think, what the producers think, and what the public thinks. Um, so we started to, we stopped thinking just about the effectiveness of a remediation option, and we started to think about all the other things that affect whether you would use it or not. And there are a very large number of them, like feasibility, animal welfare, compensation, how much would be left in the food, what the effect would be on the landscape of these measures. So there are a huge number of other things which we identified and then catalogued for every single option and then made it available on the website. So you can go to the sea, you can go to the UK and you can find data sheets for more than 100 options of what you would do for remediation after an accident that's freely available to, any, to, to anybody. Okay, so we will in some ways quite well prepared for another accident in terms of the, inf the what knowledge gained from Chernobyl had been put out there into the community and was available to everybody else. So then we had the Fukushima Daiichi accident, this loss of cooling capacity, several releases, and I say low radioiodine and cesium in food pro agricultural food products compared to Chernobyl but high radio season in game animals. In the emergency phase, you had relatively low iodine and cesium in agricultural animal products, and this is the big difference with Chernobyl. So why? You do produce milk and meat in the areas. Why is this the case? It's because your animals are never on pasture. They're housed, they're kept in barns, and they're fed stored feed. The number of animals that are outside, the, the number of dairy animals and the number of beef animals before slaughter that are outside is, is, is very, very small. So this meant that the animals were in barns, they weren't grazing pasture, so they weren't getting intercepted vegetation. They were feeding on stored feed in the barns. So the barns might have had a cover that had come off a little bit. So they might have got a little bit of contamination from uh, the atmosphere. But in general, the transfer of radioiodine from the deposit to milk was very low in Japan. Thank goodness. But it meant that the world's Chernobyl was very sensitive to the radioiodine release. Japan was insensitive the radioiodine release in terms of the pathway of milk. And so this, this was why, you know, at a very early stage, you know, once I talked to Japanese colleagues and found out that the animals were housed all the time, I said, iodine is not going to, radioiodine through milk is not going to be the same issue as it was at Chernobyl. It was, a, I mean, even if the accident had been a little bit later, you still have very few animals out on pasture. No. And in March, virtually none. Like they all housed. There was no pasture to eat. Um, you have extensive and comprehensive food bans which were very quickly imposed. So again, that was very good in reducing the, the exposure route. In the existing situation, after the emergency phase, you've got high radio season in game animals, especially wild boar, you have side effects like we were talking about, that the wild boar are now going around trashing the agricultural fields because there's many more wild boar because people aren't hunting them, etc. But you've got low radio season in agricultural animal products. Um, and you also have a tendency in Japan to be very careful. Um, and a tendency, whereas the intervention level limit, for instance, might be 100 or 50, farmers 
prefer to take the produce when it's going to be below the detection limit, not when it's going to be below the standard limit. So there's a social pressure on the farmers to get the animals as low as possible rather than below the intervention limit. Whereas in Chernobyl, the intervention limit was the one that was used. So the different social and cultural perspectives of countries can make a difference. There's limited clean feeding, very limited in Japan. And because you are working with such low levels to start with, the possibility of using in vivo monitoring is very restricted because you're trying to measure very low amounts in the animals. You know, when you're trying to measure two or 3,000 becquerels per kilo, it's no problem. But when you're trying to measure to get below 100 becquerels per kilogram, it's more of a technical problem to do that and to develop the low monitoring techniques. So to summarize, we have four very different types of sources for the accidents. So the question, we had a wide range of radionuclides initially, but the strontium was the long-term important one. And at Kushtim, the scientists working at Kushtim from 1957 onwards developed a huge expertise in dealing with an accident. And these people were transferred to Chernobyl very quickly. So in the USSR, there was an immediate availability of highly experienced radiologists who knew what they were doing straight off, right from the start. And that made a difference. Um, but with a scale, there was a response to the iodine, but no response to the polonium. So we don't know if there were, what sort of doses there were or whether we could have reduced them from the polonium. Very few measurements. Chernobyl, by far the most important and most severe, with this iodine, radioiodine in milk leading directly to thyroid cancers. Uh, this very long term high transfer in forests and in animals in upland areas. We still have restrictions in Sweden and Norway, for instance. Um, the development of a wide range of products specifically for radio seasoning in animal and options to use. And then in Fukushima, we have. Uh, the agricultural practices and the time of deposition minimized the animal contamination level in the emergency phase. And the highly conservative approach in terms of food monitoring and intervention limits thereafter have reduced it even more. So, so that the actual animals as products as a source of doses to Japanese people is very, very low. And that point about the differences in production, when we combine that with looking at the differences in the food consumption and the relative importance of animal products for different countries, it you know, makes you realize that it's very dependent on not only the production, but the consumption in different countries. And the importance of animal products in some countries and the low importance of animal products in others. So whether animal product, animal products have the potential to be a really important source of dose after nuclear accidents, but not in all countries. And that's to thank other people that helped put the data together, the analysis that uh, I've given you in the last two talks. Questions?